Okay, everybody, it is right at 4 o'clock, so we are going to get started. Um, thanks so much for those of you that indicated you could hear us. That certainly helped. Um, my name is Emily Lakemaker. I am the Associate Director of Recruitment and Student Life here at the School of Public Health at Rollins. Um, and we are really happy that you all could join us this afternoon for our Executive MPH webinar today. Um, just a few logis logistics up here at the top. Um, we're going to go through the program first, our PowerPoint presentation first. But as you have questions throughout the program, feel please feel free to put them into the question section. You can see my cursor here at the top in the right-hand corner. You should see a box that indicates where to put those questions in. Um, put those in throughout the presentation, and then once we're done, we'll go through and read them aloud and um, answer um, what we can here in the hour that we have allotted. We are recording this, and um, we will post it to our um, YouTube channel, usually within about three to five business days after the live event. Um, so you can go back and rewatch if you need to, or um, if you would like to share it with any friends that you think might be interested, we would certainly appreciate that as well. Um, so with that, um, go, we're going to go ahead and get started, and I'm going to turn it over to our uh, Associate Director of Academic Programs here in the um, EMPH program, Leah Tompkins. All right. Hi, everyone. It's so glad you could join us today. I may have communicated with some of you in the past um, about our Executive MPH program, and if I haven't uh, communicated with you in the past or spoken with you, um, please know that I'm uh, available to answer any questions during this presentation as well as after. All right, so just a little bit about our Executive MPH program. So it is a full MPH degree, so the program format is executive, but the actual degree is an MPH degree. So every student who graduates from one of our programs here in the executive format does receive a Master's of Public Health degree. So executive is just the format of the program, not the name of the degree. We are specifically looking to target uh, working professionals, so people who are working full-time. Typically, sometimes uh, our students are coming back into the workforce um, or switching positions, but typically our students are working full-time. Uh, the program can now be completed in as little as six semesters, so we do have the two-year option, which is the six-semester program, or we also have the three-year option as well, uh, which is a nine-semester program. So if you want to enroll um, a little bit longer and take last classes a semester. Um, that's an option as well. Within the program, we do have three tracks, also known as areas of studies or majors, and those are applied epidemiology, applied public health informatics, and prevention science. And I will go through each one of those in detail. Our program does blend our online and face-to-face -face instruction, so you get the best of both worlds. You come here to campus in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, for some classes, but then the majority of the coursework is done online from uh, your location. So just some history about the program. It did start in 1997 as a certificate program in the uh, distance format. It became a full degree in 1999, so we are going on almost 20 years of offering public health coursework and public health degrees and credentials in an executive or distance format. So we've had a lot of experience over the years, and it's a very well-established program. Uh, there are three components to the degree. Uh, you have coursework, a practicum, and thesis, and the overall total of credit hours is 42. So to break down the coursework for you, there are six core courses that each student at Rollins School of Public Health takes, regardless of program or format or uh, concentration, and those are listed here under public health courses. So those are incorporated into your curriculum. We have two EMPH requirements, so regardless of track, you will take a public health surveillance course, and you'll also take a public health informatics course, and then we have specific track requirements, so the rest of the curriculum is filled in by what you would need to take to fulfill specific degree requirements for your track. The second degree component is a practicum. All students, again, here at Rollins, regardless of program or program format, are required to do a practicum, which is a hands-on experience. We have recently ha brought on board a full-time practicum advisor, and her name is Laura Lloyd, um, and she's been really great so far. She just started uh, in this position last month, but she's catching on really quickly. She's actually been here at the school for a while, uh, working in various capacities, even with our practicum portal, which is how we track and monitor practicum progress, but she has now stepped into our advisor role, so we're very glad that she has joined us. The uh, practicum requirement is a minimum of 200 hours of experience in a hands-on setting, 
And so even though it sounds like that's a lot of work and how would you add that into, you know, school and what you're doing for your full-time employment plus family and social life, really that can be adjusted to how you need it to fit into your schedule. So for example, here we have listed that, you know, you might do 10 hours a week over 20 weeks or you might do five hours a week over 40 weeks. So it can span multiple semesters and it's up to the student to determine when they begin their practicum um, with some guidelines from us. Um, and then also how it's going to work out as far as accumulating the hours. And then we have for our culminating experience, we have a thesis or capstone, depending on which track you are in. So our prevention science students have a choice between doing a capstone and doing a thesis. So we have you go through a workshop if you're going to be in prevention science to select between the uh, thesis, which is an independent research project, and the capstone, which is a series of two courses that culminates in a project. Our informatics students do capstone only, so that is a part of the curriculum and there is no thesis option, whereas our applied epidemiology students do complete a thesis and they don't have a capstone option. So this varies by our accreditation requirements and what is necessary for you to earn the degree in your specific track. Um, so some examples of uh, thesis projects might include, uh, you know, a research study, data analysis, if you're going to be an EPI student, program evaluation. So it's really a wide range of what might be counted as a thesis. So typically when uh, prospective students sometimes want to talk here or talk about a thesis, they think of, you know, a traditional research study where you have a population and you sample them and do a questionnaire. Um, and that can definitely happen as an original research study. That's definitely an option. However, um, you know, there's a lot of other variables that go into a thesis. So it's not just one thing that we require here. There's a lot of options for our students. So about the program format, as I mentioned, it is a hybrid online program. So you do come to campus twice a semester at the beginning and end of each semester. So that's a total of six times a year. So uh, we do have uh, the same requirements for each time you come to campus. So we always have our students come in on a Friday, Saturday, and then half of a Sunday. So we only are only here Sunday mornings and we dismiss around noon so that our students who are out of town, uh, who reside out of town, are able to get back home in a timely manner and prepare for the, for the week coming. Uh, our dates are always available in advance. So you can see down here in the lower right hand corner in green, uh, I posted the dates for the upcoming academic year starting in fall um, all the way through summer 2018 and we will have the next year of, uh, of dates available by time you would start the program in fall 2017. So we can provide you with the whole uh, list of all the on-campus requirements by time you step foot on campus for orientation August 24th. That information is always posted online as well and we send out regular reminders of the on-campus requirements. Uh, so we are using um, Blackboard at this time, but we are transitioning to Canvas uh, as a university. So we are changing to a new user uh, web-based software. Um, so Canvas is a learning management system that you access through the internet. So you do have to have consistent access to the internet throughout the program, um, but that doesn't necessarily need to be from your home location. So many of our students travel for work. Um, and some of them also still maintain, you know, a typical vacation schedule where they might go with their family somewhere. As long as you have regular access to the internet, you should be able to particip participate um, if courses are in session. Our uh, coursework online is asynchronous, meaning that there is no specific time during the week that you need to log in for courses. So it's not like, you know, every Tuesday from 8 to 10 p.m. or, you know, Saturdays or anything like that. There's no required time for you to log in. Some of our uh, faculty do offer online study sessions or advising sessions or review sessions, those sorts of things um, where you can log in with them at, uh, and speak to them in a live version of the course. Uh, those are typically never required and they are recorded for those who cannot log in. So um, if you were concerned that, you know, I don't know how I might be able to, you know, log in on a certain day and time, it's definitely not required. So while you're here on campus, uh, each course meets twice for three hours. So if you're taking the two course schedule, then you would have a total of four course meetings. If you were taking the full three course schedule, you would have six course meetings. We do have a professional uh, conference atmosphere. So we have uh, networking opportunities, speakers, we have different trainings that we offer through the library, career services, and other uh, parts of Emory. 
And we also have student support services available during the on-campus session if you'd like to meet with somebody in person, but these are also available um, at a distance as well. So you have academic advising, practicum advising, a thesis advisor, and then we also have access to our career advising office. And here's a quick example of how our on-campus sessions go. So on Friday, we have three classes, a morning, afternoon, and evening. Again, if you're in the three-class format, um, you would have a class during each of these sessions. Two course students would only go to class two of these times, and it would depend on which courses you were in. Uh, Saturday, we have a, a morning class and an afternoon. If you were applying to our Applied Epidemiology program, we do have uh, lab times that are required on Saturday and Sunday of each opening session. So that is a little bit of extra time for our epi students so that you have time in the lab with your faculty. Um, and then on Sunday, our students return for just a morning class. And then again, our epi students typically stay for a lab class. But uh, again, typically uh, we're done by 1130 with the traditional courses. We do require a two-week online orientation, formally titled PRS 500D, Strategies and Resources for Online Learning. This actually has already been scheduled for this year, so this actually will start August 7th, which is a Monday, and it will end two weeks later on August 21st. So this is an entirely online experience. It is a requirement for the program. Um, so you will be enrolled into this as part of the program as well, although it's zero credits, so it doesn't count towards your tuition or towards your uh, registration or anything like that. Uh, so it's just an opportunity for our students to practice using Canvas, to get to know your classmates, to interact with staff and faculty prior to actually coming to campus at the end of August. Um, and also the day that it ends, August 21st, is the first day that you have access to your classes in Canvas for the fall semester. So it's well-timed in that you're prepared for class to begin, and then you have access to class, and then you arrive on August 24th for the in-person orientation, followed by uh, class starting on the 25th. And so we've gotten some really great feedback about PRS 500D, the online orientation. So first, uh, some folks are hesitant about starting an online hybrid program because they've not taken a class in a distance format, or maybe they've just been out of school for a long time. Um, and so just know that the experience is designed to help you become accustomed to being in the online program and helps you get oriented to what it's like to be a student in the EMPH program. Uh, so a quick note about our EMPH team. So um, our program chair is Moose Alperin, and she has been the chair uh, since 2008. Our administrative coordinator is Karen Hudson. I'm Leah, your ADAP, and I help you with uh, uh, academic advising. Our Associate Chair of Academic Affairs, Dr. Lori Gatos, is very instrumental in the thesis advising seminars and also in serving as a thesis advisor herself. And then we have four full-time instructional designers dedicated to the EMPH program, which is very unique to an online program in higher education. Typically, instructional designers are shared between programs or schools, um, but we're lucky enough that we have four dedicated staff members to help the faculty and students in their courses. Um, and they are Manish, Angie, Julia, and Sharita. Uh, so some other advisors that you'll have access to in the program, your uh, track directors are uh, for epidemiology is Dr. Jody Guest, for public health informatics it is Mark Condi, and for prevention science it is one of our associate deans, Kathy Miner. So they are also available to students to provide support to them, provide academic advising and uh, career counseling in some ways, and then also uh, help out with thesis design and thesis format. Uh, we also have our practicum advisor, who I mentioned is uh, Laura, and she's up in the left-hand corner in the red. Um, and then up in the right-hand corner is Dr. Juan Leon, and he has come on as our prevention science thesis coordinator, and he also helps out with, with our thesis advising boot camps. So he's very instrumental in the research and thesis side as well. So we're typically looking to recruit professionals into the program who have experience in public health or a health-related field or industry. That's not necessarily a requirement, just typically we tend to find that uh, people who are working in a health-related field have an interest or a connection to public health. Um, for our informatics students, they typically have some sort of computer science or technology background. Again, that's not required, that's just typically who we see coming into the program. So if this uh, areas don't necessarily align with your background, that's okay. We have students come into the program from all different sorts of areas. Here is just a quick snapshot of our last four up until 2015 uh, cohorts. 
uh, about where they lived geographically. So you can see we did have some international students as well. So they resided in their home country and then they would travel back and forth to the U.S for um, class for the on-campus sessions, as well as for commencement and other special events like that. Um, so if you don't live in, here in the Atlanta area and you see uh, one of the states that you do live in highlighted, just reach out to me and I can connect you to the person who's from that state. They're typically either an alum at this time or they're currently still in the program. And our most recent cohort, uh, which started this past August, August 2016, is reflected here. So we actually had quite a bit of out-of-state representation in this cohort. Um, we had several students from uh, California and then quite a few students from Texas this time, as, long, as well as up and down um, the East Coast. And our one and only student from Oklahoma also joined us this year. So here is a sample of the uh, majors, the undergraduate majors of our applicants from the last four years. So you can see there's a wide variety um, of students with different backgrounds applying to a degree in public health. So if you don't have an undergraduate degree that has the word health in it, that's completely fine. Um, we're used to that and we welcome a lot of uh, students from diverse backgrounds. So some more information about our fall 2016 cohort. So there were 53 students who began the program this past August. The majority of them is prevention sci are prevention science students, and that is pretty typical. We tend to see more applications for prevention science because it is such a broad program, whereas informatics and epidemiology are very narrowly focused. Um, so you can see the distribution there. Our gender, uh, we typically have a majority female population applying. Um, which is pretty typical for the health fields and the caring professions. Uh, for, as far as uh, the race composition of our program, we are proud to be a minority serving program. So the majority of our students come from uh, backgrounds that are not indicated as the majority of um, wider Caucasian. And now I'm going to go through each of the tracks in detail and give you uh, some examples of the curriculum for those. So first is our Applied Epidemiology track. If you like research and you like numbers and quantitative things, this might be the best track for you. Um, so typically our epi students are interested in tracking disease, either chronic or infectious disease, and looking for indicators of those diseases in populations. So there is a strong quantitative sequence the first year of this program. So our students go through Epi 1 and 2 and then epidemiological modeling in three consecutive semesters. In those same semesters, they take BIOS 1, 2, and 3. So there's a very strong uh, quantitative sequence for this program. Um, so if you like that sort of stuff, you're very much into numbers and statistics, then this might be the best program for you. Um, some of our other courses that are required for this track include population-specific uh, courses, such as maternal child health, um, or uh, disease-specific areas, such as chronic diseases. And here are just two of our faculty and their research interests. So our epidemiology students, as I mentioned, must do a thesis as their culminating experience. So you must have a RSPH faculty member as your chair for your thesis. So we provide information to our students about uh, all the faculty that are available to them, as well as their areas of research interests. And then students are able to connect with faculty who have similar research interests. And some of our graduates have gone on to the positions that are listed here. A lot of our students from epidemiology tend to go into a federal agency, and typically that is the CDC, although sometimes uh, we also have our epi students go into like the FDA, the USDA. Um, we've had one go to the VA, and then we've also recently had a few go to state departments of health. So um, while typically our employers are federal, there's also state uh, and local employers as well. Next is our public health informatics track, and as I mentioned, if you have a background in technology or computer science and are interested in data and data analysis and data analytics, this might be the track for you. Here are two of our faculty. Paula actually works full-time for the CDC, and she is one of our adjuncts, um, and she uh, teaches uh, later in the program. She teaches one of the uh, last classes you'll take in information security. And then Jamie actually lives in Boston, so he is very much like some of our students in that he uh, comes to campus for the on-campus sessions. 
Um, but he is a consultant at a Boston foreign informatics company. So he travels back and forth just like our students do. So he has the same experience in that manner. And here are some job titles of some of our recent graduates. Typically, our graduates are going to go into a consultant or contractor position. Um, again, usually for a federal or a state local agency, but sometimes they go into a private situation as well as for uh, Kaiser Permanente or something along those lines. And lastly is our prevention science track. And I, as I mentioned, this is a very broad degree, so it's not narrowly focused on any one specific type of public health. Um, so if you're interested in community health, program planning, research design, evaluation, assessment, um, any of those sorts of things, prevention science is likely going to be the best track for you. Uh, so Dan Rutz is one of our faculty members. He works full time as the, uh, one of the communications directors for the CDC. So our faculty um, who are adjuncts tend to be very well connected within the public health field and they usually are working full time for a federal or state or local entity. And then uh, Iris is one of our faculty members as well. She actually recently retired from her position in the DC area, but is still teaching for us part-time. Um, and her areas of interest are substance abuse, program evaluation, and behavioral research. Our prevention science graduates go on to all sorts of different types of position, and it's really hard to categorize in one slide. Um, but some of them will go into the local county local or county health department. They'll work for nonprofits, they'll work for government agencies, hospitals, clinics. Um, really, they could work in any really sort of setting. Some go to NGOs like the Carter Center and they want to you know, do international work. Um, so it's really, really broad about what these students might go out and do after graduation. All right, next up is our admissions uh, portion. So uh, all of our choir, all requirements must be sent to SOFIS, so the application must be completed and verified with SOFIS for the degree-seeking application. All your official transcripts from previous schools must be sent to SOFIS, so if you attended you know, school a long time ago and it's been a while since you've gotten your bachelor's degree, that's okay, you'll still need to send those transcripts in. So any enrollment in an institution of higher education needs to be sent. So even if you went to a university or college for just one semester or you maybe did a, study, a semester abroad, all of that still needs to be reported as part of your application. If you are applying to the epidemiology program, uh, we do require the GRE scores, and I'll go over our requirements for those on the future slide. You will need to submit a CV or resume, which indicates at least three years of full-time work experience. The admissions committee does tend to look for people who have public health or health-related work experience, but that, again, that's not required, just preferred. Uh, you must write a personal statement about your commitment to public health, your goals in the future, what has brought you to apply to this program at Emory, and how you might see yourself fitting into um, public health as a profession if you're not already in the profession. And then you must have at least three letters of re recommendation, and we do prefer to get uh, recommendations from a current supervisor, a former supervisor, and maybe a current colleague. Um, if you don't have access to those, uh, academic references are great as well. So if you have recently been enrolled in a, another program uh, as an undergraduate or maybe a certificate student, um, and you have a professor or advisor who can write a letter for you, those are great. Uh, colleagues, if you do nonprofit volunteering and you can get a letter from someone who organizes that, um, that's good as well. If you are an international applicant, you'll have to uh, provide a few extra things. One of those is a TOEFL or IELTS score. You will need to have your transcripts for any institutions outside the U.S. sent to WES, which is the World Education Service, and they will do a transcript evaluation. And then you must provide a financial certificate showing at least funding for at least one year of study. All right, again, for our epide epidemiology students only, we do require the GRE. The GRE is not required for prevention science or public health informatics, just epidemiology. So we're looking for scores around the 60th percentile uh, when you uh, complete your exam. And typically, those actual numerical scores for verbal are around 156, 148 for quantitative, and then around 3.5 for analytical, but again, we're looking for about the 60th percentile. 
Um, if you have the MCAT, we can substitute that for the GRE, or if you have the ECFMG, you would be waived from the requirements. Uh, please be sure that your scores are less than five years old. And then also, if you have a terminal degree from a U.S. institution, you can also be waived from the GRE requirement. So to apply, you can just go to portal.sofas.org. Our application deadline for uh, our priority deadline, I should say, is March 15th, so that's coming up in about a month. Uh, so anyone who has completed an application in SOFIS by this date is automatically considered for both scholarship and admissions. Um, after this date, we will likely keep reviewing for admissions, but scholarship consideration is no longer guaranteed. Uh, so here's some information about the timeline you can expect for your application. So unfortunately, there is a bit of a lag from when you complete it in SOFIS to when we get it here for review. Um, so please keep this in mind. If you are just now starting an application, um, you would probably need to be doing that pretty quickly. Um, so typically we hear from applicants that it, it takes anywhere from two to four weeks for them to complete the application in SOFIS. SOFIS holds your applications for anywhere from two to six weeks while they wait for documents such as the letters of rec, the transcripts, the West evaluation. Um, so they can have it from anywhere from two to six weeks. And then it is transmitted here to the school. Uh, our Office of Admissions receives it, and they have it for processing for anywhere from one to four weeks. And then finally, it is sent here to the department for review. So it can be quite a lengthy process to, from start to finish. Um, so please keep this in mind if you have not started an application yet. And here's just another way to view the application process. Um, please note that if you are applying, if you want to apply to more than one program here at Rollins School of Public Health, so let's say that you're really interested in the prevention science track, but then you're also considering EPI. Um, so what you want to do in your application is select your program of first choice in SOFIS, apply to that program, go through the whole application process, and then RSPH will contact you after we receive it, and you can add up to two additional programs for no extra cost. So if you add more than one track in SOFIS, you'll be charged extra application fees, and that's not necessary. So just please keep that in mind if you are interested in more than one program. Right, some information about our scholarships and investment strategies. Um, all students at Rollins who are enrolled in the EMPH program and have at least five credits a semester are eligible for federal financial aid. Um, so our three course students who are going to finish the program in two years are automatically eligible for this as each of those semesters already includes five hours or more. Um, however, if you were going to consider doing the two course program, uh, not all of those semesters has five credits. Some only have four credits. So you would have to keep that in mind if federal financial aid is something you're considering. Emory does offer a payment plan each semester. So if you're using some aid, um, but then you also want to pay some out of pocket, then you have an option to do that in installments and it is available year round, so fall, spring, and summer. Um, and then some of our students choose to spread their tuition payments out over a longer period of time and enroll in two courses a semester. Again, that will take three years, um, but it's a lower tuition amount each semester. We do have some scholarship opportunities here within this school. So again, as I mentioned, anyone who completes an application by March 15th in SOFIS is automatically guaranteed to be considered for these scholarships. And there's no additional paperwork or anything that you would need to do. Um, we will flag you when your application is reviewed if you qualify for one or more of these scholarships. So some of them are very specific about who they are looking to award these scholarships to as far as new students. So, for example, the sensor award can only be awarded to somebody who works in a state or local public health department. The Hearst scholarship must be um, awarded to somebody who works in a rural community in the southeastern U.S. So typically that's somebody here in Georgia who's working with a rural population, but that can also be awarded to somebody in a different state. Um, and then the Saratine scholarship is awarded to a Georgia public health professional who's also working outside of the Atlanta metro. So we have some pretty specific guidelines for who we can award these scholarships specifically, but we do have other scholarships as well. Um, we have our merit scholarship program, which is our largest merit, our largest scholarship opportunity, and any student can be eligible for this. Um, so it's not required that you live in a certain area or have a certain type of job. This is a very broad category for merit. 
Um, and then we have our Emory Courtesy Scholarship. If you are an Emory employee, uh, you may be eligible for up to five credits a semester in tuition support. Um, and we encourage you to reach out to your HR rep to talk to them about your eligibility, as well as to speak with them about tax implications if you are going to use the Emory Courtesy Scholarship. So just a few more slides here. So I just want to go over why students come to us here at Emory in the EMPH program. So Rollins School of Public Health is consistently ranked in the top 10 of schools of public health in the U.S. And often we're near the top, usually one or two, we sort of flip back and forth. Um, so we are in the public health capital of the world and ranked as one of the top schools in the nation. So within Atlanta, there are so many opportunities um, for us to connect to the public health profession. And we do this through not only uh, the students in our program, but our faculty, our guest speakers. Um, it's really a great way to become networked within the public health field. Um, so just here in Atlanta alone, right next door, is uh, one of the main campuses for the CDC. The Carter Center is down the road. The American Cancer Society is headquartered here, as is CARE. Um, so we have a lot of opportunities here for students to get connected. We are an accredited school of public health. We do maintain two accreditations, both our regional accreditation and then we have our professional school accreditation through CEIF. Uh, we do have our dedicated instructional designers, as I mentioned before. It's very unusual for a program to have such a strong support network from the IT side. Our faculty have constantly been winning awards for both research and teaching. Um, and it really is the best of both worlds. So you get to remain in your home community, remain in your full-time job, um, but also you get to go out and come to Atlanta if you're not already here, um, meet your faculty, meet, meet your cohort, and work with some uh, of the really great minds in public health. And we often hear from our students that what they're learning in class is immediately applicable to what they are doing in their work. So the classes they're taking, they're able to go back to their uh, places of employment, to their bosses, and say, you know, I learned how to do this you know, program evaluation, or I learned how to use this software. I'm really going to be able to use this in my current job, and this is how it's going to benefit uh, not only the company or the organization, but also uh, my colleagues and myself. So we really hear from our students that what we're teaching and what they are learning is really useful to them. Um, so here's just some information. So our, just our generic email address, emph.emory.edu. This will come to me as well. So if you haven't communicated me, with me in the past, um, that's fine. This email works as well, as well as my personal email address. And then the phone number there, it comes to my office. Um, so if you want to jot those down, and then I've also listed our website there. We have a lot of great information on our website, including our uh, curriculum outlines, um, information about the practicum, the thesis, careers, all of that is online, and we encourage you to go look at that. Okay, so now we're going to open it up to questions that you all may have. And so feel free to type those up in the questions box. Um, in the upper right hand corner right now it looks to be empty but my guess is that um, you guys probably have a handful of questions out there and we're more than happy to help take those right now um, in the meantime um, while you guys may be putting those in um, I certainly want to take the time to mention our um, admitted student event which is called Visit Emory um, which will be March 30th and 31st, um, a Thursday and a Friday. We have um, a specific executive MPH uh, session for that on the Friday of that event. And um, Leah and the rest of the department leads that. And if you want to maybe talk a little bit about what, what's covered in that. A lot of the same information sure. that we just covered, but a little bit yeah. more in depth, like about the curriculum. Yeah, so um, we're actually, so for our portion of that event, we invite not only admitted, but also prospective students. So if you're still in application by March 30th or 31st, um, that's fine. Uh, we're still welcome, still glad to have you join us on campus. And our main event is on Friday, March 31st. Um, and we will be gathering at 1230 to start and have lunch with everyone um, uh, for about 30 minutes, just to get to know each other a little bit. Um, at 1 o'clock, I will do a short presentation. Some of the information I just went over will be in there, but I can also go into more detail about the curriculum. And we'll have our uh, up-to-date curriculum uh, sheets available that day. Um, and then uh, we'll have a faculty student panel that day. So that's actually the highlight, I think, of that event, is getting to talk to the current students who are going to be there. Mm -hmm. We also are um, working on getting some alums to join us as well, and then also faculty as well. So it's a great time to meet folks. Uh, we will have uh, 
an online option too. So if you want to use a webinar uh, format like we're using today, um, you'll still be able to hear the panel, see the panel. It'll be filmed and streamed and everything. So it's still a great opportunity to speak with them, even if you're not in the same room. Um, we try to be really considerate of our students who really are at a distance, mm -hmm. and we make a lot of options available to them to participate um, pretty much all the time. Um, so if you're available Friday, March 31st to come to campus, that's great. Um, but if not, um, we're glad to have you log in with us. So Amanda's asking, how long should the personal statement be? Um, so typically, well, it depends on if you want a double space or a single space. We don't really... <laughs> We don't really have any requirements about format as far as like, oh, you want to double space it? Great. Um, so typically I see uh, double spaced formats or double spaced um, statements to be mm, anywhere from two to four pages. Uh, single spaced, it's usually a page and a half, two pages. Um, although the, I will say for me, those are trickier to read. So if you can double space, I appreciate mm -hmm. that. I don't know about the rest of the committee, but um, yeah, if you want to double space, definitely, I'd say at least two pages. I mean, more, I think, is always better. Um, if you can go into more detail about your goals, your backgrounds, uh, your uh, career aspirations, your research interests, those sorts of things. Um, but yeah, I would say at least two pages is typically what I see. All right. Um, all right. You're very welcome, Amanda. Glad that you could join us today. Um, do you have any other um, final thoughts or anything, Lee? It looks like it's kind of quiet on the question front. I think that is a good sign of you covering yes. everything that could yes. possibly be covered. I'm just so comprehensive. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, so just to let you know, we do have one other webinar coming up on uh, March 7th. It's at noon. Again, it'll be most of the information I went over today, but it's another opportunity just to log in if you want to speak to me in real time, although it, I'm always available to set up a phone time, phone call if you want to uh, let me know a specific day and time you're available or if you just want to try and catch me in the office. Um, but yeah, so we have just those few events coming up for the rest of the um, month, for the rest of the season. So admissions is um, in full swing now, mm -hmm. but it'll be closing in the not too far future. So we really encourage you to, if you haven't started the application in SOFAS, to do that. If you're working on it, to go ahead and get it finished before March 15th. All right. Well, thanks so much, everyone, for joining. Oh, wait, we got another question. Um, Amanda's saying, I would like to make a, an announcement about one of the alumni. Dr. Um, Dr. David Westfall just won Man of the Year for his dedication. So, yeah, Dr. Westfall actually teaches our PRS. Dedication to public health. Oh, okay. Yeah, he's actually one of our, he's not only an alum, but he's actually one of our faculty members. Um, Dr. Westfall also teaches uh, planning and performance measures. Um, which is a requirement for our prevention science students. So I actually just emailed with him yesterday. Yeah. Um, he actually is getting ready to retire for, after being a director of the Georgia Department of Public Health for many, many mm -hmm. years. I'm sure he'd appreciate it if I wouldn't say how many. <laughs> um, and he's actually getting ready to go uh, after the semester ends. He's going to go hike the whole Appalachian Trail. That's impressive. I know. He is. He's a amazing. So yeah, I'm glad that you know about him, but yeah. he is definitely going to continue teaching in the program. Thanks for bringing that up, Amanda. Awesome. Okay, so um, I guess with that, we are going to go ahead and wrap up. We were, um, again, we we're so happy that you all could join us, and um, you have Leah's contact information, so if you need any additional information, please um, don't hesitate to reach out. And if you want to go back and rewatch any of this, um, we're going to have it up on our YouTube channel um, in about three to five business days. Thanks so much, and I hope you all have a great rest of the week and a great weekend.